things we learned last year is that our technology panel is actually something that really resonated with a lot of folks in the room, so we've brought it back. And I'm really excited um, to introduce Sarah Levine Meyer, who is our director of strategy, who's going to introduce our panel um, and the panelists we have today. But just wanted to say before we get started, we do want this to be interactive like the last panel was, so I will be around with the microphone. So wait till I get to you and then you can ask your questions so we can make sure we get it recorded. Take it away, Sarah. Cool, thank you. Can you guys hear me? Yes? yes. Cool. Um, so thanks all for still being here. That's totally awesome. Um, we're rounding out the day. We, we're back. From last year, we have one adjustment. We're excited. Uh, Emma Birdsong is here. We're, I'm going to have each of them introduce themselves um, so that they can tell, the, tell you a little bit more. Just as a heads up, we did for all of today schedule a lot of cheering and excitement in the background. <laughs> for the last panel, we were just getting started. You guys did awesome. And things are going to get a little bit more rowdy now because you know we're, we're getting more energetic. It's really just about the panelists. Um, <laughs> so why don't we go through and have each of you just tell everyone a little bit about yourself and your background at One North, and then we can get into some questions. And like Don said, we'd love to keep this conversational as we start talking through things. Um, if there are questions that you have about what some of them are saying, then we should look for raised hands, and we'll walk around and, and get those questions uh, shared with the group. Ben, you want to start? Yeah. My name is uh, Ben Pomerantz. I'm a tech lead, and uh, I've been with One North for a very long time, probably about 12 years. And uh, I've pretty much worked on every technology, every project. And my favorite thing to do uh, at work is solve problems, which is great, because that's what I get paid to do. Um, I'm Emma Birdsong. I am an associate developer at One North. I started in June. I just graduated from Vanderbilt in May. And my favorite thing to do at work is annoy this one. <laughs> <laughs> and I will say, she does a very, very good job oh, of doing that. Thank you. Thank She's you. Very talented. <laughs> Hi, my name is Michael, and I'm a techaholic. <laughs> Hi, uh, Michael. <laughs> I'm actually an architect here at One North, and uh, I've been with uh, One North for about four years. Hi, I'm Michael Lachlan. I've been with One North for just over 10 years. I uh, started as a developer. I'm now the head of QA and managed applications. I probably talk to many of you and work on a lot of your sites. Um, and at work, I like to, I'm really passionate, and Emma probably has a good story of me being really passionate, showing her how to debug something. She thought I was a little wound up, but it was just <laughs> really exciting. Was it the day that you had that coffee or that? Yeah, it was. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah he, was, he was really turned okay. up about that. <laughs> Okay, so why don't we start by talking about the theme of this entire conference, which is endurance, right? So when we start thinking about our technology plat platform and approaching technology with endurance, what sort of uh, advice or um, how would you recommend people approach technology, especially considering that te technology is constantly changing and evolving, there are new systems and new ways to connect those systems. What sort of recommendations uh, do you guys have? Yeah, I'll go, ahead and take, I'll go ahead and start us off here. So um, the approach that I really love is, you know, building a really strong core around your digital ecosystem um, that's able to be extensible and able to change over time. Um, so how do you plan to do something like that, right? Um, I'm going to go with sort of the theme here, and I'm going to go with a bit of an analogy. So let's look at the NFL. Let's look at a team like the New England Patriots, right? They have won their division like 12 times out of the past 13 years. They've been to the Super Bowl six times. They've won it four times. Now, the NFL is a league of parity. That means when you're, you, one year you could be in last place, the next year you could be uh, winning your division, um, except if you were the Chicago Bears. But I don't really <laughs> want to talk about them too much right now because they kind of, um, it's a sore spot for me. So, um, so how, how, do, how do the Patriots do this, right, uh, with all this parity in the league? They do it by applying um, a strategy where they built their core really strong. They built their core strong, and they're able to go out and keep that core strong by drafting, um, making draft picks that are, that are smart, 
um, and doing, you know, filling holes with free agency. They don't go out and just buy the, you know, most expensive free agent out there. They, you know, they pick and choose. So um, they're not the only ones who've done this. The Bulls of the 90s have done this too. Um, and you might say, well, they had Michael Jordan. They did, but they also had him in the 80s too. So they did not start winning championships until they actually built that core to be really, really, really strong. Um, there's another team out there that's kind of employed this uh, thinking, you know, of, you know, build a strong core. And, you know, they've recently won a championship. Um, if you guys, I think you guys know who I'm talking about, the Chicago White Sox. I'm sorry, that's my wishful thinking because I'm a Sox fan, but no, it's the Chicago Cubs. They brought in Theo Epstein. They told, you know, they told everybody, like, hey, we're going to rebuild this team to win, not now, but in the future and for a while. And they said, we're going to lose. We're going to build up our farm system. We're going to do this. So they did all that. And look at, and now they're celebrating right across the street uh, a championship. And um, many more to come, probably. Um, so know, we should see. Talking about this, and there's one thing that they all have in common, too, is that they look at what they've applied, they reassess, and they make change direction. Um, a lot of those, you mentioned New England Patriots, one of the things they do and they're well known for is to get rid of people before, or get rid of people, let them go before they actually start to decline. Um, you want to make sure, it's the same thing for technology, you want to make sure you're on top and knowing what's going on, reassess and bring in new technology when you need it and judge it, you know, basically judge it and see if it's uh, providing what you need. Yeah, I, I just want to follow up a little bit more. So you might be saying like, yeah, that's professional sports or whatever, so how does that really really translate to digital endurance. Um, if you think about it, you, you know, take everything away and you just look at it, they're both goal-based. Like, I really believe in goal-based, right? Your goal might not be winning a championship, but your goals, you know, are what's gonna make sure you succeed or not. And that's how you're gonna measure yourself. And how you apply that strategy to those goals through your digital ecosystem. Think of your digital ecosystem like your team, you know, your players, your, your blog post, your website. All that stuff. So, you know, applying that, you know, is really easy when you have that strong core. You're able to, you know, kind of you know branch off of, for new tech technologies, implement new integrations quickly, and um, you know, you know, be able to provide solutions for new technologies that come out. Uh, yeah, um, I'm gonna nerd out for a minute. Uh, I'm shocked. The, yeah, <laughs> um, the the cool thing about baseball is as much as is a, uh, it's a great sport to watch and it's a great sport to enjoy, it is also a sport of mathematics. And everything in that game from, from looking at a player to hiring them to how they track throughout their entire career to the very end of it is all based on just the mathematics of, just the predictive mathematics that they, that they use to, to, to build a team and control a team. And that always boils down to analytics and ana analyzing your team, your player. So when you talk about goals and analysis, it always rounds out to what do the numbers say and where are they telling us to go? And, and I, I mean, I watched a bunch of the sessions yesterday uh, uh, in the office and, and I gotta say, like everybody was saying, analyze this, how do you wanna, portray a goal, how do you want to define where you want to drive people on your site and all those things. It's always the only way to prove that the decisions you made actually worked or had the desired effect is through your analytics. And that, and that is just the, that's the direction that, that it'll, it'll provide you uh, success for your goals. I, I, I provide, I, I actually do analytics for our team. I'm as, I, actually, I, I actually manage Emma. And so it's the, what I call the uh, bug fix to bug introduction <laughs> ratio. So our, my developers get graded upon how many bugs they're actually fixing or how many they're actually creating. So <laughs> Emma's been, uh, her, she's been increasing her ratio lately, so. Yeah, I That's got go some good bonus points yesterday for fixing something you caused, so. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 
Um, something that I wanted to add to this was something that I actually took from Colin's presentation. Um, he said something about being obsessed with your data, and uh, I think that's huge because it's really easy to let something get out of hand and lose that endurance when you lose touch with it. So being obsessed with your site, being obsessed with your technology is really going to help you keep a good handle on maintaining it and knowing where it needs to grow and where it's strong and where your weak spots and taking care of those. So when you think about setting yourselves up, um, I think a lot of times when we start to work with clients, there's this question about you know, whether they've identified the platform they're working with and then are trying to figure out what the strategy is to leverage that platform, whether they're working through <coughs> developing the strategy and then figure out the tools to support it. Um, what are your thoughts on you know, which comes first or whether they need to be coordinated or how they fit together technology versus the strategy? Yeah, I'm, I'm totally passionate in saying that you need to have a strategy before the technology. Technology is something that makes something you have in place faster, maybe uh, more efficient. But if you're doing the wrong thing already, I can make it go faster, wronger, you know, make it, make it get to the wrong point faster. Um, so you really want to have that strategy in place, know what you want to do, and then, then you can determine from that what technology you should use to achieve those goals. Yeah, I'll take a little bit of a different approach to that. So, I mean, I, I do agree with, with Michael here that strategy really does come first, but I like to call it strategy informed by technology. So as, as you're you know, creating your strategy, you, you need to be informed about technology of what you can do, right? So if, you're not, if you don't know exactly what you could do, um, for example, if you don't know that you could put analytics on your site to gauge uh, customers, your strategy might differ to like how you're thinking about um, applying stuff. So uh, being informed of you know, technology when you're creating your strategy is kind of my stance on that. It is, it, yeah, it can yeah. definitely, you can see that in making sure that you have the technology. I think we have a question. Actually, you can see that. You, I can see you having the technology, knowing what you can and can't do, yeah. and then creating, uh, creating a strategy from that. It's, I'm looking at more of the, more, uh, more of the bigger strategy, okay. you know what I mean? And, then, and yeah. then basically making sure that you get the technology on how to deliver that. Sure. Is this on? So my question, you say be informed about technology. When I was in Big Four and consulting, I could get Gartner uh, analysis about uh, applications and things. I'm finding that it's not as easy to get that kind of third party information about the applications that are available now. So I totally want to do this ecosystem thing, but where are the stats on what CRM applications are highly effective in the legal space? I don't, I don't have those in hand. I, I've been looking for them, and um, I don't see that. Uh, the best I can get at right now is lots of meetings with lots of salespeople to try to gather what our capabilities and stuff. Am I missing something, or is there some other way of getting, of getting informed about technology? Yeah, I, maybe I was thinking about it more, you know, I mean, from my standpoint, like, not, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a great question. I mean, finding that, you know, that information out there. So you, you have to know where to look, um, even if it's even available, right? Um, not everybody's going to share their, their data with you because it's precious, right? It's their data. Uh, so um, I'm we, thinking more of a, along the lines of, like, what kind of... <laughs> Hang on, we've got a... We yeah, go to... Hello. <laughs> I would recommend being involved with ULTA. Um, I get a lot of information out of it and their programs, but most importantly, it's peer oriented, and that's what it's talking to your peers within legal. I mean, this is that's, great too, but yeah. ULTA, I've gotten a lot out of that's, it. I, I follow up, and that's exactly <laughs> what I was going to probably say next is, is have you been talking to your peers? Mostly because I, a lot of times when I'm involved in these integrations, I'm hearing, I, we integrate with many of the different systems, so I see the challenges on all the sides, and what I'm hearing is that the feedback that, the challenges that everybody's having, they're all having the similar, similar types of challenges, and they've all gone with different solutions, or you know, some the same, but you can find out what, what you might be able to overcome by talking to the peers and figuring out, do I have those same challenges? Can this system help me solve that one? That type of thing. There's also an aspect of understanding what you're trying to accomplish before you get there, right? So that's part of it, right? Being able to, to find the right data means knowing what you're trying to solve for. Um, so not all the, the combinations of tools are going to work the same way for the same for every firm. Um, so 
let's talk, go ahead, Ben. Uh, I think that um, there's, uh, there's also a much, there's a much uh, broader spectrum of software that's available as well. And, and sometimes it kind of boils down to you need to find uh, the, right, the right kind of subset of software that you want. Do you want it to be entirely online? Do you need it to be local? Do you need to be able to host it one place? Does it need to integrate with your SharePoint environment? And, and those questions are um, easily answered by anybody familiar with that technology. But piercing that veil of getting past that salesperson to actually talk to somebody who is technically savvy with that software can be complicated. But, um, but like when I have a problem with my internet and I call up the phone company and I'm like, hey, just put me in charge with a tech guy that I need to talk to. I, I don't need to follow your script. Yes, I turned it off and back on. Yes, I've already unplugged it and replugged it back in. Yes, I have done all of these things that an, an uninitiated, unenlightened individual would try. But I am looking for specific answers. Please assist me in getting to somebody who can answer those. It's usually a lot better. Um, and as far as strategy versus technology is concerned, uh, it's it's very hard to build a house without a plan. Um, it, you know, as technologists, we're often asked to solve a problem and you know, build the second story on a house and I want it painted yellow, much to Nate's chagrin. Um, but the, the fact is, is that, sure, we can do that, but we gotta understand a lot more of that first floor and the basement and how is the whole thing supposed to hold itself together and is there a garage or not and all these other things. We have to understand uh, a really bigger picture and that all gets defined and structured with strategy. Yeah, I mean, like going to your example, so what I mean by, you know, by building a house without a plan, right? Yeah. But you can build a much better house if you're informed by the materials that you're able to get, right? Say That's money's true. not an issue, um, you know, Say you don't know anything about electricity or anything like that, right? We're informed that we have electricity. We're informed how you m make concrete. So we're like, oh, I could use concrete for my foundation, right? So I mean, it's kind of like we don't really think about it that way, but that's just kind of the way that I, I, I'm thinking about yeah. uh, strategy informed by technology. Yeah, I think of it kind of like a game plan in a way to tie it back into the whole sports theme. Um, so you can't really have a game plan if you don't know your players and you want to know your players before you decide what you want them to do. So say you have a quarterback and he has a terrible arm, well then you're going to plan to run the ball instead of throw it. Um, and that's something that you kind of want to put in place with your strategy versus technology ordering. We have a question back here. Hi, my name is Jen Bullitt. Hi Jen. <laughs> Um, so I think one of the things that as a marketer um, I struggle with a little bit is understanding, we talked a lot about sort of this digital ecosystem, um, understanding the ins and outs of data integration and also how you go about sort of integrating the different systems. I was wondering if you guys could give us sort of a little bit more of an in-depth view of how you sort of help clients think that through. Um, this year we started using HubSpot, and I think that you know moving forward it'll become a bigger piece of what we do, and sort of tying it into all of our digital, so that we can kind of start to see how people are consuming our content is really helpful. But we haven't quite gotten there yet, and I think a lot of other marketers are maybe in that same situation. Yeah. So when you get into integrations of multiple systems. Um, Whatever, whatever, what have you, if it's like you have a Sitecore as your main platform and you have some other systems tying into it. The first thing I'm going, the first real step I'm asking is like, where does the data live? Does, does the profile live inside of Sitecore? Does half the profile live inside of your intranet? Does the other half live over here? Um, basically, I want to see how the data flows because that will actually help me know where I should be concentrating the most on. Like, where is, if you're going to have a profile for the web and you're going to concentrate on everything inside of Sitecore, or whatever platform you're using, if it's going to get overwritten by another system or it needs to be used in other third parties, uh, other third party systems, you want to make sure you have a place and you're thinking about how and where that data goes. Um, there actually was, there's a great talk from uh, NPR about their system. Uh, they have a system where they manage all the data they want for an article. They actually write it three or four times, one for tweets, one for blogs, one for uh, the web, however else you have it. They all manage it in one location. That way you can go out to the different parts. So 
because to, to try and solve that, uh, try and solve that issue. But I know what we deal a lot with is you're running you're running data for print or PDF, and then you've got it differently on the web, and then you've got it you want to have it on somebody's intranet so they can find it there too. So that's that's where I start is I want to know how the data flows and what what you're trying to accomplish with the data. Yeah, I mean it really depends, you know, uh, like on the integration itself too as well. So each integration, you know, can have their own different, you know, methods. Um, so the way I'm looking at it is uh, going back to that core, making that core technology really extensible, right? So I, I touched on that when we, on our first question, making that extensible. And what I mean, and here's a perfect example about making it extensible, um, making sure that, like, you're able to get your data out to these sources or data in to your source, which is, like, Michael's example, Sitecore. So um, pulling that data and pushing that out and being able to provide that quickly, right? Um, so that's something, you know, that's, I, you know, I'm, I'm talking about extensibility for that point of, be, point of view. So there, I mean, we're ta we started talking about technology or strategy first, and I think a lot of folks in the room have some set of technology tools, right? So they've already established some set of tools. They're either using them or starting to use them. But all of these tools are so feature rich. How, and this sort of builds on Jen's question, but how would you recommend identifying which features within which tools to use? Because if, you know, in real reality, a lot of them overlap as well, right? So you yep. started by talking about the sort of where the data is, um, like the origination for the data, the, the place that it sort of lives. Um, how does that relate to, you know, the types of decisions that need to be made about which tools do what for you? Or are there other factors yeah, that, you would yeah, yeah, that you would yeah, yeah, yeah. recommend but, but, uh, considering as well? It, it um, more often than not, you, I mean, you know, when, when you think about uh, having, uh, using your CRM technology to track the analytics on your website, that doesn't, doesn't work. You know, when, when you talk about, um, uh, when you talk about, I wanted to find a goal for getting content out in, to, in front of people's faces, you can, you can review your successes with that, with your analytics. But, <clears throat> but when you start thinking about uh, how, do I continue, how do I continue managing my relationship with the people who have viewed this content, um, that's, you, you need to manage that through like a profile, right? And, and when, you, when you start talking about how disconnected these pieces are, um, the, the way to make them communicate, that's, 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 that's yeah. I don't know. I, have, I, I, I think, I, like going back to, like, 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 as I'm thinking about it, you know, so it's like, you know, which pieces to use, right? Which pieces, you know, do, do we use? And I think that's the question of, like, how do you figure out, you know, which ones make sense? And that, that all goes back to your strategy, right? What are you trying to accomplish, right? So with, with all these different, you know, um, software suites being so feature rich, which ones are going to work for you? Um, it really depends on what you're trying to do, right? You're not going to use um, a, a certain feature just because you have it, right? You want to have some strategy behind that. So um, it's more of like an informed you know, process. Like you really need to understand what you're trying to accomplish before even turning or using a feature or thinking about it. Um, but at the same time, you want to know about the feature so you know it's there. So like, oh, <laughs> I can implement this strategy. So that's going back again to my kind of thought behind you know, um, I, I think understand like, the tools in your yeah. toolbox. Yeah, exactly. I think there's actually a lot that goes into that. I mean, there, you have these big content management systems that are doing email, email marketing. They're doing some of them are trying to do proposals. Some are trying to do what have you. And then I see, based on in your way you're setting up hosting or based on the way you're doing something, it's not going to work the way it, they're selling it because it's not set up perfectly because of some other reason. Um, and then you want to go, you want to send out an email, so you might look at a service or something like that. Um, a really good example is when it gets down to the video, we always talk about, almost always talk about, host your videos inside of YouTube or Vimeo, right? They're the best of breed. Why, why go to a third party or have us create a way to play your video when there's a company that's dedicated to doing that and provides the analytics and provides all the other stuff you need around it just to have it all in one system? I, I do like the idea of just finding the best of breed and using those. So let's talk about making your technology work for you, right? So 
We've had a lot of conversations around optimization and analytics and things like that. Um, what sorts of advice do you have for people in order to uh, drive towards making, making their technologies work well for them or sort of optimizing their technologies? Yeah, it's uh, analytics. I mean, it's kind of, you know, I mean, that's your tool, right? I mean, really, I mean, that's going to really tell you if what you're doing is working, right? Or if what you're doing is failing miserably. Um, what? <laughs> yeah. Because it happens, right? I mean, I, that's why ideas are ideas, you know, they, they, they're not always great, but um, to get to the good ones, you have to go through bad ones, right? You, you learn from that. So, um, <laughs> and I've had some of those, I think, yep. right? Just yesterday. Yeah. Just every other day. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, really, you know, analyzing that, and, and I, I find that a lot of people, um, and I think I was talking with Michael about this. Michael's really been geeking out about analytics lately, so um, I, I was talking with him about it, and uh, I think he was mentioning um, about, like, people have the Google, Google Analytics on their site, but they really don't know what to do with the data, right? They don't know how to create reports. You know, they don't really know how to report rightly. Uh, correctly, so I don't know if you want to. Yeah, I was actually, when we were sitting here watching the talk before, so I was really excited to hear everybody talking about analytics and they were actually getting the reports. And um, there's three, there's actually multiple services we tend to use on a lot of our sites for, uh, for Google. We have the, maybe you're using Google for your site search, or maybe you're using, you got Google Analytics. And then there's, another, there's other tools that I use as a developer or as a, a technology lead where I'm sitting there going, I want to see how Google's crawling your site. So you got the, what they used to call Webmaster Tools, and they changed the name. But you could tie all that data together and find out what people are actually searching to get to your site. And this is the type of thing that I, I'm, I've actually made a little bit of a goal myself to try and get all, uh, everybody set up like that so I could get a nice chart and I could see all, all, the, people, all the sites we manage to say, hey, this is, this is what we're seeing happening. Or it gives you a little indicator saying there's an issue with the site and I could see and I could take action on it. Um, sort of like an, an indicator. And it's, I know that's what you, uh, what you all are probably looking to get to as well, too, is to get data that you can take action on, not just the data, not the raw data. Um, and I know Google's trying to provide that, and it's just a matter of how we interpret it and go forward with it. Um, but yeah, that's the, that's the goal. I, I really am starting to get <laughs> enjoying it a lot. He has been. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, think, I think there's also a, a, a piece of, I mean, uh, who is uh, Mitch and Kathy were, were talking about this yesterday, and they were discussing about you know, there's so much information that, you know, your analytics can provide, but it, it really needs, you need to narrow your focus because just looking at the big picture all the time isn't helpful. It'll, it'll show you big trends, it'll show you, you know, that there's an ocean, but it's not gonna tell you where the waves are, where's there a storm, where's there this one thing that I need to pay attention to. And it's always better to start small and then work your way out. Um, you post, in, you want to start driving traffic and getting people to sign up for an event. And how do you notify people of that? You send out a direct mail through snail mail, you send something out through email marketing, you post something on Facebook and LinkedIn, and you tweet it. And all of a sudden, you've got now a multiple different routes to get to the same information. And if you track all of those, now you can start to see, you know, this Facebook post has about 10 times the number of people that are clicking through and signing up for this event. We need to start paying attention to that. You can't see that if you just say, well, there's 100 views on the page. You have to be able to say, how are people getting here? How are people getting here, and what are they doing? Um, it's really easy to track a conversion on an e-commerce site. I got somebody, they search for a pair of socks, they buy the socks, I send them the socks, they don't return the socks. Right there, you've got a real easy track for the return on investment for, the, for that one change you did on the website that made them buy socks. But when you look at professional services organizations, how do you identify that ROI? It's very, very difficult. At the end of contract negotiations, do you, you slide a little card across the table and say, how did you hear about us? Check mark the box. That, that's, that's not, it doesn't work that way. It's harder. but. It's all about how do people get here? How do we get information? Um, and you can track all of that. And all of that is accessible through analytics, not just Google, but also Sitecore, through, through all of it. And it's helpful. So let's switch gears into things that you think that are 
interesting happening in the world of technology today. So, um, you know, in general, what is what is piquing your interest, and in, what are you reading about right now? I read about just about everything. Um, like for me, it's you know a lot of the cool tech, you know, the nerdy tech, you know, like all the augmented reality uh, stuff that's coming out, and um, all the advancements in VR, right? Um, yeah. All the you know the cool things like the Amazon. Um, or like Alexa, right, from, from Amazon, you know, voice control, you know, smart assistants, um, bots now, you know, being able to do uh, small tasks for you, easy to write, you know, plat being able to push them across your platforms. Um, it's changing so fast, it's not even crazy. Like, the amount of de different devices that we have now compared to five years ago, or even last year that are coming out is growing. Um, and it's like the big um, IoT, you know, um, initiative, you know, where it's like, uh, you know, just getting huge everywhere and there's just devices and everywhere. So I like to read about all that stuff. Um, yeah, I was actually thinking about the Internet of Things as well um, because a few years ago I can remember being in a college class and a professor doing a presentation on the Internet of Things and it was just a glimmer in his eye and now you look around and wearables are everywhere and you've got the Amazon Echo and you've got all of these things and while they're great for us as consumers and like they make our lives easier, they're also really phenomenal for marketers because you're able to get so much information about your clients and your consumers that you wouldn't have before and you can really like cater these experiences to people in ways that like you couldn't have imagined five years ago. I've been getting into uh, universal application development, which is a really big bunch of words that just means you build an app in one environment and it's deployable over multiple. So that you build an iOS app uh, app for an iPhone and you can put it on an iPad. You repurpose it a little bit, change the code a tiny bit, and now you can put it on Android or an Android tablet. And you tweak it a little bit more and now it's available in Windows 10 and the Windows Phone. Yes, I still have a Windows Phone. Um, really? Everybody asked. Do you really? Yeah. Yes! <laughs> I, I have one too. It's, uh, it's, just, got rid of it. it's a paperweight at my house. Right <laughs> That's basically what it does. Like they won't even trade it and they're like, nah, it's good, you keep it. <laughs> I'm like, okay. But the, the whole thing is, is that it's, it's not, you know, it, it's not something that every uh, marketing environment needs. You know, you need, you need the website, you need the information out there, you need that content, you need that brand awareness. But not everybody needs an, an individual app for a subsection of your website. Sure, it's great. But, you know, you start to talk about, well, can you do that on the web? Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. And then you start saying, you know what, I want to be able to make this, build it once, and distribute it over a wide range of environments. And that's what I've been getting into lately. You know, all these things that we, we just talked about goes again to my core thought, you know? <laughs> so, like, extensibility, you know, making sure that your data is allowed living in that one spot, right? That, that data, you know, that, that place is where you're driving all this stuff from. Um, it's not any different from thinking about a cloud, right? From, you know, from Azure, or you know, from Amazon, you know, it doesn't really matter. Um, so, just kind of want to tie that in there. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> it's fine. Um, I'm actually really into uh, Internet of Things, but smart home. Uh, I've got it controlling the heat, controlling the temperature, lights, what have you. Um, but I'm also I'm really kind of into Google services, so I'm really looking into Google's uh, technologies. They've got a new language, sort of language they're putting out, AMP, trying to make the, the make it faster. So I'm reading. I've been really following that closely for the last year or so. Um, stuff like that, I try to stay on top of. I don't want to, I try to stay at the cutting edge of stuff, but I don't want to implement it quite a, uh, right away because I want to make sure that it's going to be something that's going to be useful or is it just a fad. So I try to try and stay on top of stuff like that. So Blaha, you keep talking about extensibility. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you about that. Sure. You, you know, everyone has a lot of content, mm -hmm. right? Uh, what sorts of advice do you have for people in terms of making their content extensible. We're talking about technology. Yeah. And how And the content, is, the technology is meant to support the content. So what sorts of things right. should people be thinking about? Yeah, I mean, I, you should be really thinking about, like, um, you know, keeping your data in, in, a, in a format. So you, you're looking at your data and, like, maybe, you know, you, you, you have a big profile of somebody that has all this stuff on there, right? So, like, sorry, stuff. <laughs> Um, I mean, like, you know, they have, you know, profile information, they have first name, last name, you know, all that kind of stuff, you know. 
they have all these different fields. Um, so making that data to be able to, you know, modularizing that out where it makes sense. So maybe, you know, you want to just send uh, a particular subset of that data to somewhere else. You want to make it, make it, put it in a way that's easy, right? So that goes back to like designing your data model, right? So when you design your data model out, and that's kind of what we do, right? Uh, we, we think about these things. And we're thinking about, okay, so what happens when um, we want to extend this, right? What, it, it, we got to make it easy extendable. We don't want to have to edit, the, like, oh, we want a new field, and now we have to add a new field here, 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 here. We, we build it in one spot, and we have everything else inherit from that. So, like, stuff like that is stuff to keep in mind. But um, as far as extensibility, it's just, I mean, it's as easy as, like, having, um, you know, an access to, you know, um, an API that serves the data. Uh, like, in a JSON format, you know, is probably the best um, out there right now. I mean, it could be XML, I mean, uh, whatever it be, or it could be both, right? So it's always nice to be both, right? Um, because you never know what somebody else is going to need, you know? Oh, I can only do XML, right? I can only do JSON. Oh, I can do both here, right? I mean, here's these two different feeds that you can actually consume our data from. I, I think it ties, it actually, extensibility of your content should actually tie back to analytics. And I know it seems weird, but I'm gonna explain it. Um, the, the way you view your content is important. So I'm gonna look at content on a laptop versus a device versus a tablet. Um, in your analytics, you're gonna see a breakdown of who, who's viewing what and how. Uh, if you look at the career section of your website, how many people are viewing that using a phone? Ask that question. It's a simple thing. Is your, the career section of your website viewable by a phone? Does it look good? Is it easy to use? Is it optimized for that? Um, no, your content is absolutely the most important thing on your website but it's got to be seen. So make sure that when you look at the analytics, something really simple, how are people looking at the content in each separate section of your site? That's how you make your content extensible. All right. <laughs> um, we have a little bit less than 10 minutes left, I think. Do we want to see if we have questions in the audience or we can keep going? I just want to. Does anyone have any questions? We're answering all your questions. All right. Um, can I ask questions? Sorry? Can you, I have, ask you, questions? you can ask questions. Okay. Hey, did you get that bug fixed? <laughs> <laughs> Shh, not in front of the client. <laughs> um, so, what is some of the things that you guys are working on today? You know, let's try and connect that to the things that you think are interesting in the world um, that you're reading about. So how do you see the, the things that are happening that are sort of on the cutting edge of technology starting to impact the world that we sort of work in more consistently? So things like the Internet of Things, wearables, that type of uh, sort of future that we're heading towards. What, what sorts of impacts do you think that'll start to have on our lives as marketers in the professional services space? Um. So something that we actually talked about in one of our office tech talks recently was AMP. And it's something that's going to make viewing web pages on mobile devices much more enjoyable. I don't know how much you guys use your mobile device for news or things like that, but that's where I go primarily for news. And it's always so terrible to open an article and it jumps around constantly as images and ads are loading. Um, and so this kind of will combat that issue. And I think that's something that we're going to start to see in the work that we're doing um, because it's something that we'll probably want to integrate into what we're doing for you guys. And I think that's exciting to think about. Um, I've been actually building the, my very first iOS app. Um, and it's been a, a fantastic education in not just the uh, interesting view of, of the way an iPhone app gets built, but also it's amazing the, the ins and outs of how the app store works. It's the ins and outs of how you communicate from an app to a website to get data. Uh, I need to deal with security. I need to deal with speed. I need to deal with ease of viewing. 
Um, and all of those things are so natural and simple when you're dealing with a browser because it's all integrated, it's all part of it. Um, but when you're dealing with an iOS app, it's a little bit trickier. You gotta know a lot more about how you're communicating and then once you're logged in, how is that supposed to work? Um, it's, uh, it ends up being, um, it ends up presenting challenges that I've never really had to deal with in a very long time. But you start to look at it and you say, you know what, that, that's a problem that's been solved. People have solved it. I, I know that information is out there. Um, you can find it, you can implement it, you can work with it, and mold it for what you need. Um, that's, that's what the, yeah. that's the amazing stuff that I work with. I, I was just thinking, like, just because of the devices we were talking about, I was thinking about something like, think about this, you know, uh, VR, right? So here, here's something interesting. Um, so let's say, you were able to capture this, right, at th this conference right now and broadcast it live to people that are actually using VR. The experience would be so much different for them. Instead of sitting in front of a monitor, they would actually could feel more, and you yourself could w watch conferences, like feeling more, um, you know, uh, how do you say, I'm trying to say, like more. Immersed. Immersed, thank you. Um, more immersed in the conference. So I kind of like, I see that as an opportunity, you know, maybe down the, li down the line. I mean, it's not there yet. Not a lot of people have this technology, but I think it's something cool that could, you know, pop up in professional services. And something to go along with um, app development. Uh, I've done some iOS and Android apps myself, and you really have to think about your users in a different way um, because the way a user would use an app is going to be different than how they would use their website and how they're interacting with that UI is going to be different. So it's a whole new mindset and really getting to know your user more so than you had to do with your website. Yeah. Yeah, it's also, there's also this whole idea of when, you're, when your user is using that app, they have allowed your app onto their phone. Exactly. That is amazingly mm -hmm. personal. Right. And, and I know it doesn't seem that way. But it, it really kind of is. It's, you know, you can connect with a lot of other pieces on their phone. You know, a phone number appears on a web page, you click it, and it'll ask you three times if you really want to dial that phone number. If you're in an app and you touch a phone number, it will immediately start dialing. That's, that's a little bit, you know, it's, it's a little bit more open. You know, I recently just upgraded the size of my iPhone, and when I had a 16 gig, if you got to be an app on my phone, that was quite a privilege because space was very limited. <laughs> I actually built, uh, when I used to have a Windows phone, I actually built an app called Childhood Memory. It's just like a, a memory game because I was just trying to learn how to, how to do it. So I built it, and it was downloaded a grand total of seven times. So, and um, that was my mom, my dad, and myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, in all honesty, I mean, that, it, it was kind of cool. I'm like, when, when, when I did, it was, it was a little bit more than that, but not, not a lot. And I was just like, that's kind of cool. Like, people actually tried it, you know? Like, I was able to create something, put it out there, and, you know, people were actually trying, you know, used it, right? And somebody even commented on it. They said, like, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, was all right. Huh? That yeah. Was your mom? yeah, it was my mom. <laughs> So in our last couple minutes, um, let's get very more specifically connected to the topic of the, to of the last day and a half. Um, there are a lot of people here who are on Sitecore. We've been talking about moving from a project to more of a program um, for, for tools like Sitecore and other similar foundations and, and things that we know are connected. What are ways that people can, from a technology perspective, start to make that shift? What does that look like from the technology side? Because we've been talking about it a lot from the conversational side, sort of the internal communications, expectation setting, the, you know, from a content side, I think we've talked about it from analytics, the sort of way to set yourself up. But from a technology side, what does it actually look like? Again, I think it goes back to building a strong core, right? Okay. You need to have that to be able to you know, do like a program, you know, type model. Um, you're not gonna, you, you wanna concentrate on that and then roll out stuff, you know, as you, you become more informed by analytics to know what's going on on your website. Um, so, like, for example, you would look at your data and you would see that, oh, people actually like this type of content. Let's just call it content X, you know? So, um, they like this type of content. Let's build out a more detailed page 
structure here, right? So you're able to you know, start thinking about it that way. Like, okay, I want to actually create a whole new section here based upon this topic, right? Instead of it just being its own small piece. Yeah, in terms of technology, I think you want to make sure that you are on the version that supports what you need. A perfect example is Sitecore. Yeah. Uh, you want to make sure you're on the newer versions for doing personalization um, and stuff like that. So just basically reassessing your software, making sure that it's going to support what you need. If it's four years old, there's probably, and since it's definitely in technology world, you're probably several uh, iterations behind that you could probably update. Um, and then find out if that's actually what you want. That's actually a good time to reassess if that's the right solution for you, too. Do you, want, do you need something new? Um, that would be a perfect time to do that. I think it actually kind of relates back to what John Simpson talked about a couple of years ago with the relationship cycle. I mean, that's one of those things that you have to keep on reevaluating, keep on, keep through that churn. Sure, you put together your website and you released it, um, but you know, once it's out there, it's not like Field of Dreams. You build it, they will come. It's always about you put it out there and then you got to make sure that it gets maintained and the content stays fresh. And it's not just about the content, it's also about now where are people going and how are we doing this? What are my goals for the website? It's always, it always comes back to that. It always comes back to the goals. Like, am I achieving what I want? And if I'm not, how do I get there? Or do I just need to reevaluate my goals? You just have to, it's that, you know, it's that perpetual churn of, of self-discovery, of, of kind of trying to figure it out. It can be philosophical or it can be technological. Have you just figured it out? Uh, no. <laughs> no, I, just just do, I do not spend enough time meditating over, web, meditating over websites. So, okay. Sorry. All right. Um, does anyone have any questions for the group? All right. Well, thank you all for taking the time to listen to us. Thank you, guys.